Good morning to you all. Here some months ago, we had begun the study of the book of James, and today I would like to continue with that study. You will find that the Apostle James was a very practical Christian. Some may think of him as a nuts and bolts kind of person. The question we should all ask ourselves as we look at this book is, does Christianity exist outside of a practical response to the message of Christ and the Apostles? Having that question in mind, let's begin reading in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. My brothers, do not hold the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus with partiality. For if someone enters into your assembly in fine clothing with a gold ring on his finger, and a poor person in filthy clothing also enters, and you look favorably on the one wearing the fine clothing, you say, Be seated here in a good place. And to the poor person you say, You stand or be seated by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves, and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers. Did not God choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that He has promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor. Are not the rich exploiting you and they themselves dragging you into the courts? Do they themselves not blaspheme the good name of the one to whom you belong? However, if you carry out the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, and thus are convicted by the law as transgressors. My brothers, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with partiality. What is partiality? The Apostle James describes this scene in the context of a synagogue where a man enters and it is obvious to all that he is an influential individual, successful in business. Some, someone quickly gets up and rushes to make this man feel welcome and comfortable. Shortly thereafter, a man enters who obviously does not have it all put together. His clothes are tattered. He smells like he needs a shower. In this case, everyone is embarrassed. It may take a while until someone even gets up to help the man find a seat. And then they put the poor man in a corner. Maybe they even have him sit on the floor, but on, not in a place of honor. What might partiality look like here in our day? It is normal to feel more drawn to, to some than others. The question for us today is, who gets the most attention or recognition? Or let's take this a little deeper. Whose opinion do we recognize as valid and whose opinion do we reject because we happen to like one person better than another? Do we practice church politics? Promoting one person over others because one is more my kind than another? In Matthew chapter 25 verse 31 through 40, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right hand and the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I also like to read in Luke chapter 9, verse 46. And an argument came in among them who might be the greater of them. And seeing the argument of their heart, Jesus took a child and set him beside him, and said to them, Whoever shall receive this child in my name receives me, and whoever shall receive me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all, he shall be great. And then also I'd like to read, also read in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not each man teach his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to the unrighteous, and the sins and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I believe that often how we relate to those without is an indicator of how we feel and think about those within. It seems like James starts off talking about two different types of strangers coming into an assembly. The first man of some means and influence, the second man a man of the street. His question is, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In other words, how we think about those who come through our doors is a strong indicator of how we evaluate those who are a member of the body of Christ. Did not God choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? In reality, what this whole subject boils down to is those who have earthly goods and those who do not. The moment we begin to assess others in our minds according to what they have or do not in earthly goods, we are on the wrong track. In fact, we are actually fighting against God. James says that God would rather we be poor in this world and rich in faith. Our vulnerability in this life is a kind of refining fire, or it can be, causing us to rely more heavily upon God in all things. Did not God choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, that He has promised to those who love Him. Are not the rich exploiting you, and they themselves dragging you into the courts? James also reminds them that the wealthy and the prominent are those who promulgate persecution. Another side of this whole thing would be that it is the wealthy who often demand payment, no matter the dire circumstances of their humble subjects. James says, Remember this before you go and show special favor to a prominent person in the context of the body of Christ. For whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point only has become guilty of all of it. For the one who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Thus speak and thus act as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is merciless to the one who has not practiced mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. For whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point only has become guilty of all of it. What is James talking about? Is he promoting that Christians are bound by, to the Mosaic law? I believe what James is trying to do here is he's using an extreme example to make his point. Remember, most of these people to whom he is writing are Jews. Hence, they would have understood the obvious breach of the law if one were to do very well in obeying all the major laws except one. For example, if you're very careful not to commit adultery, but you do murder, all the keeping of the rest of the law means absolutely nothing to God. Conversely, if they or we, as followers of Christ, do well in most things as regarding the teachings of Christ, and yet we show favor to some and then despise others, our religion at that point becomes vain. Thus speak and thus act as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty. Those who are true followers of Christ are living according to the law of liberty. What is that? Those who have been delivered from sin because of the blood and death of our Lord, we are all freed from sin because mercy was shown to us, and we are called to do the same for others. We are called to be merciful, leading others to repentance and freedom from sin in Christ. How can we do this if we do not show mercy? For judgment is merciless to the one who has not practiced mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If we treat others in the same way as we would have tr God treat us, we do well. But if we forget that it is only because the mercy of God that we are where we are today, we become inflexible and our hearts no longer are no longer touched by the misery and desperation of others, we are in a bad place. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I really believe 
from what I see here, that one of the things that really wins the heart of God is the favor and mercy we show and kindness towards others. We see each person we meet as a candidate to whom we might show the love and care of our Lord. Back to the book of James again, chapter 2, verse 14. What benefit, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? That faith is not able to save him, is it? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking food for the day, and one of you should say to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but does not give them what is necessary for the body, what is the benefit? Thus also faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. But you, but do you want to know, O foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working together with his works, and by the works the faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What? is the benefit, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith and does not have works? The big question for all today is, can faith even exist without practical demonstration? It appears that James is still thinking about the whole thing of how we relate to others. Yet, as he has this in mind, he begins to take it a little deeper, or perhaps the whole subject takes a little different turn, much in the same way as our thoughts and conversations morph from one thing to another, or one thought to another. To the Apostle James, Faith meant action. It meant an evident response. He uses the example of a brother or sister who is lacking food and clothing, and you desire to make them feel better. So you say, make sure you get something to eat and get yourself some clothing to make you stay warm. So you can stay warm. But you do nothing to make that possible or tangible to that person. Kind words are always appreciated, but kind words can be much like what is often called faith in our day. People believe in God and his kingdom, but it has no real impact on their personal life. Back to the person in need. The best thing to do for that person is to get them some groceries and go purchase them some much-needed clothing, and perhaps you might even help them find a job that is adequate for their needs. Faith in our Lord is much the same. We know what he desires of us. He left a living example for us it behooves us to step out and do something and dispense with the philosophizing and the theorizing. The kingdom of God is not only demonstrated in word, but it is in deed and in truth. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Believing in God is a very good start. But the question for us today is, does my belief in God have any true impact on the way I live? James says, great. So you believe that God is, and that He is one God, the demons even know the same, and believe the same, and their teeth chatter. The question then is, has their belief about God changed anything about their eternal destiny? No. Why? Namely because they continue being servants of Satan. They have never surrendered their will to God the Father. You see that faith was working together with His works, and by the works the faith was perfected. How is faith made perfect? I believe perfect in this sense means complete. If Abraham would have told God, Yes, Father, I believe you are right. I believe the idea of sacrificing my son is a good idea. And yet, if he would have continued living his life as before, saying, I have surrendered my son to the Lord, would Abraham really have prospered as a follower of God? Believing in our hearts is only half of faith. Faith must have action. Faith must be followed by obedience. Faith is often simple obedience to things we really don't understand. And yet, 
we only begin to comprehend once we obey. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Hebrews 11 verses 1 and 2. Faith must have tangible substance. It is not merely a misty, airy belief. The evidence of faith is action. And if you read back over those who were approved by God in the Old Testament, you will find they were men and women of obedience to God. They acted according to the commands of the Father. This is faith made perfect. This message was only part two of a series that we are doing in the book of James. So if you have been blessed by this message, keep watching, and soon we hope to include a link in the description below to the previous message and the following messages. God bless. Thank you.